Okay, wonderful. There should be a slide deck coming. Um, in the meantime, I can start off uh, saying uh, welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to have you all here. Uh, it's great for me to be able to stand up here and, and welcome you all face to face for the first time in so many years to actually have a skills summit back in a face to face setting. So that's amazing. So first of all, um, Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Keith Russell. I am the Interim Director Outreach at the Australian Research Data Commons. And um, the first thing I would like to do uh, is, and it's a tough act to follow after Auntie Joan, uh, but acknowledge the First Nations peoples and the land on which we are meeting today. For the, so that's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. So uh, I would like to extend my respects to elders past and present and also to all First Nations peoples here today. So, just to put a bit of perspective around um, ARDC, uh, apologies for those that already know ARDC and have heard far too much about ARDC in the past, but uh, a quick, quick run through. ARDC is a facility funded under ENCRIS, so National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. We're Commonwealth funded, and uh, what we do is we provide research infrastructure. Now, there's a range of different facilities out there. There's, I believe there's now more than 25 of them that all provide pieces of research infrastructure. Some of those are specific to disciplines, some of those are instruments, some of those are facilities. In the case of ARDC, it's very much across all disciplines and it's about data. So our focus is very much around looking at data and making sure that researchers can use, create and reuse and make available high quality data assets. Oh, thank you, that looks familiar. Yeah. Um, find the HDMI See if I can work around this. There we go. Yeah. Apologies. That's right. Yeah. I'll just check. There you go. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Thanks, Mary. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's, it's great to have a wonderful team that helps you out. It's amazing. Um, so, yes, our purpose is to provide Australian researchers with a competitive advantage through data. Now, one of the questions you get a lot about is research data commons. What does that actually mean? What do you mean by that? What does that look like? And we see it as a sort of a virtual place that brings together data and tools and assets and compute and models. But if you look at this diagram, one reason I pulled out this slide is because right smack bang at the top are people and skills. We think people and skills are very important elements in inner research data commons. If you want researchers to be able to use, reuse and create data, then they need to have the skills to actually be able to do that. And they need to have staff to support them in that. Now, we're not alone in thinking that. Um, there's been multiple reports out there emphasizing the importance of skills um, in different aspects and in different perspectives. I've pulled out just, a, just, just two to, to provide a little bit of perspective. So one of those is a report that was published by RMIT Online 2021. So this is very much just coming out of COVID and thinking about Australia in a time post COVID. And first of all, they identified that was 87% of jobs require digital literacy skills, at least at some level. So it, this is crucial. It's so important to ensure that the Australian population has digital literacy at at least some level. And as they were talking about technology workers, talking especially about the importance of digital technology workers and emphasizing that we're gonna need 156,000 uh, dig, dig, more digital de technology workers by 2025. That's only a few years away. So there's a quite a big challenge for us out there to look at how we can increase those number of people out there that are available to deliver digital technology. Another report by the National Skills Commission looks at, um, looks at emerging skills. And as it looks at emerging skills, it identified that actually digital and data skills dominate. They are the most important, one of the most important areas that is that, where the demand lies. And they are seen as gateways for transition between jobs. So there's clearly a big issue and a big challenge for us out there. And if you look at, they mapped out the cutting edge skills being required and being asked for. And you see here uh, a number of, the, well, all of these are very much in the digital space. So cybersecurity, um, machine learning, and um, data visualization are identified as key areas that, um, that are being required and being re requested. 
Now, to get to these skills it doesn't happen overnight. This is not something you can teach somebody from one day to the next. What we need is pathways, pathways to get people upskilled and to, get, to gain that experience. So we need to think about this as a, as a complete pathway running across K-12, vocational education, higher education, but also ongoing learning as people are employed through government and industry. And thinking about um, the emerging technologies as they change and as the needs change, making sure that people can adapt to that and they have the skills to adapt to those uh, changing needs. So back to ARDC and where we're at. Well, we, from our perspective, we care a lot uh, as a research infrastructure uh, facility. There was a research infrastructure roadmap, and in that research infrastructure roadmap, it talked a lot about skills for actually using the infrastructure. It's all very well to have all these wonderful instruments, but researchers need the skills to be able to an understand the data they're getting off these instruments and being able to actually use these instruments, and they need support. They need workforce uh, skills and career pathways for those research infrastructure staff that can support them in using the data and analysing the data. So it works on both sides. Now, ARDC has been working on this for several years now. Uh, we have a, um, um, a digital research skills agenda, which picks off a number of areas we were working on. I won't go into all of the detail here. A um, number of things I wanted to highlight, things I think are important. For one, I think skill summits are very useful and very valuable. We've done a few of them, well, we've done them face to face. Then we had the COVID years, so we had to do them virtually, which was very sad. And it's lovely to have you all back here face to face and seeing everybody in person. It will allow these rich conversations and discussions we're hoping for for the next two days. Um, also, uh, we've been working on the uh, upside down carpentries. We normally do them the right way up, but uh, we're quite flexible. Uh, so the carpentries uh, as, a model, uh, as a model for teaching digital skills to researchers and getting more universities on board with the carpentries model and using that. Uh, another piece of work we've been working on is DRISA, uh, Digital Research Skills Australasia, a portal. We've built this together with a range of partners from around Australia. Um, and what we're doing with DRISA is trying to bring together the events, the materials, the data, uh, sorry, the training providers, and the actual training materials that are being made available. So people can actually, researchers can find what is there and uh, find the right training for them. So we've got two action packed days ahead of us. Uh, first, today is very much focused around success factors for training. So, first, we're going to get a virtual presentation by Jason Williams from Cold Spring Harbour uh, in New York. So really looking forward to that. That should be fun. And after that, a range of uh, lightning talks and discussions. And hold on to those lessons learned that you're going to be picking up today, because tomorrow we want to apply that and say, well, what does that mean for national skills policy? How can we apply that? And how can we use that to narrow the skills gap? So thank you all for your attention. And uh, I would like to hand back to Catherine. And I would like to First of all, I'd like to say a big thank you for her for organising all this and the team for making it all happen and getting all this sorted. So, thank you. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the 2023 Skills Summit, Jason Williams. Um, I must give another shout out um, to Christina Hall and Melissa Burke from Australian Biocommons for introducing me to Jason last year. And I got to meet Jason in person because he was visiting uh, Melbourne where he was hosting a number of workshops and um, bike principles consultations, which I managed to attend some of those too. So Jason is an assistant director, external collaborations at Cold Spring Harbour Laboratories uh, DNA Learning Centre, where he works to spread hands-on biology education internationally as Education Outreach and Training Lead for Cybers, the US National Cyber Infrastructure for Life Science. Jason provides training and support to scientists and educators, helping them leverage the most advanced tools and best methods for research and education in data-intensive biology. Jason organises, instructs and speaks at more than a dozen bioinformatics workshops and conferences annually. Additionally, serves on several committees and boards for projects that advance science and science education, including his service on the steering committee of the Software Carpentry Foundation and was chair in 2016. 
And as an instructor for software and data carpentry, organisations that centre around scientists, teaching scientists, computational um, best practice. And Jason is co-creator and lead instructor of the Science Institute at Yeshiva, did I pronounce it right? Um, University High School for Girls. Now, I hope that bio was okay. Um, you didn't tell me otherwise, so. <laughs> cool. All right. All right. Over Good. to you. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. Yes. So we even have time for questions and discussions. I'm going to share my screen here. And um, once again, uh, thank you so much, Catherine, for the opportunity to present. And thank all of you uh, for, I guess, thankfully, you're in person. I am on Zoom. Uh, so I, I hope you, you, you get something out of this and enjoy. Um, I'm putting here a QR code and a, and a quick URL. So I believe that will work. Uh, for you to be able to download slides, uh, so feel free to have them. Um, also, it's an accessibility thing. Someone might prefer to read the slides on their own uh, device, so I'm keeping that up there for just a, a moment more, and uh, hopefully that works. I haven't had time to test it, and I, I uh, also resisted the urge to change my slides um, after, you know, once you post them and everything like that. Uh, as Catherine mentioned, I, I'm at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, which uh, is uh, almost on the opposite side of the earth, but I hope you have a chance to visit one day. It's quite nice, I, I enjoy it. Uh, and I'm and within that, I'm at the Learning Center. So we do focus on education um, at, at many different levels. Uh, we have middle school programs, um, high school hands-on activities, um, all types of project-based and, and mentoring activities, and also faculty training, which is what I spent uh, some time on. Um, we have a whole collection of websites and online education, and we also have uh, various centers in the, New in the New York area, as well as uh, centers that we've either uh, collaborated on, including, uh, uh, well, I think you're not in Melbourne today, but in Melbourne uh, and, and elsewhere in the, uh, on the planet, we've had the opportunity to really work with fantastic people all over the world. So I have a question for you, um, and you can think about it for a second. Uh, take a second. Although, I mean, don't don't skip ahead and spoil um, my surprise, but what makes a superhero? It's an interesting question. It's somehow where I'm going. If you'll indulge me for three or four minutes, um, it's a question to reflect on. And I'm asking that question, and it's a little bit inspired by this graphic, which I thought was cute, and which I dug up from some old slides. And it talks about superheroes, um, and actually, they're sort of origin stories, because the title of this talk is, this talk is about what makes, what are the, what's the origin story for the modern researcher? Um, and there, and at least in whoever put this together, they said, well, there's a couple of different ways that you get to be a superhero, at least according to a comic book or, or a Marvel movie or something. Um, you might have the right technology, or you might have some trauma in your life that you've gone through that, that turned you into a superhero and you ho hopefully had to become. You might be just rich. Uh, like, I don't know why exactly uh, Scrooge McDuck is there. I guess I use him again. Um, or you might have had just a lot of training that enabled you to become a superhero. And it's interesting, right? Batman is at the center of this because I guess he had, like, all of those. Um, so that, that's an example of, a, you know, a superhero origin story. Now, um, my part of my thesis here with this or my running thing with this is that we, we are, uh, obviously we exist within an, a structure, uh, particularly an academic structure. And the argument that I'm making is that the structure, the way that academia is, this is actually gonna be a rant. I'm sorry, I, don't put, I didn't put a warning or a warning label. Uh, the structure that we have in academia is built around, I'm saying the origin story of its quote unquote heroes. In other words, uh, there's a picture of who is uh, what makes a good scientist, what makes a good academic. And even if that person is not real, um, we've actually sort of built the system to reward that person and not necessarily uh, the people who are ordinary people, who are all of us, uh, maybe. Maybe there are some superheroes there. Um, I find that to be a fantastically bad idea um, because I think when you give uh, certain people power to make decisions on other people's lives about what good and bad is, um, you can very easily give that power to somebody who might not do the best things with it. Um, so, you know, that could happen uh, in this case. Uh, but also, you know, I think people have seen sort of the idea of the stereotype scientists and there's all sorts of things to talk about uh, who is a scientist. 
So what is what am I talking about and, and bringing it in? Because those themes of treasury and trauma, I'll expand for a moment and, and talk about it. Uh, this was a this was a, a a slide and a quote um, from NIH. There are a couple things in here. Naturally, I'm in the U.S., so I'm going to be a little bit talking about our own system. Uh, I, I know that in Australia, you have um, a more perfect system. I don't know. You can tell me, uh, but. Uh, it was very interesting. I mean, I pulled this quote from a blog post talking about where does the research workforce go once we train them? And the quote from this, it was 2012, so maybe people are a bit more woke now, uh, if we want to use that term. But the person said, I was quite surprised by the idea that the majority of our trainees do not end up in academia. Did this surprise you? Right? So, I mean, it's just a reflection. I, I can't quite pass judgment. Um, but it's a, it's a reflection, right, that there are people in power, and I'm not meaning this to, you know, everybody's hopefully uh, gets their chance at the wheel to make decisions, but um, are we in a situation where the people who are making decisions about how things work uh, in terms of uh, workforce and training, they may not be connected to the reality of things. If you want to ask the question stereotypically or, or cynically, I don't know, about how to be a successful researcher, uh, what are your strategies going back to the hoop superhero theme? Well, you could just be rich. That might make you a successful researcher. Again, Scrooge McDuck was noted on the earlier slide. I really don't know. I don't consider him a superhero, but maybe he has so much money he was just on that first slide. But this is a this is a, a, a di, uh, just a, a look at the funding situation. Um, at, at, at NIH, this is recent, this is 2021, and talking about uh, what age do, our, do researchers today get um, their, their major, first major research reward, and that, that time has definitely been um, creeping up there, although people have been trying to, to counteract that. But in other words, you know, if you happen to strike that uh, early on, that, that could lead to a successful career. But as we all know, and, and this one is also NIH, and it's also, I think, similar if, if you look at the different um, Australian funding mechanisms, that the success rates are really low. So I'm going to argue that there's not going to be many of us uh, who are going to become superheroes just because we happen to get a lot of grants, because it's not going to be that many people who are able to do that. Uh, another strategy for being a successful academic uh, could be just enduring the pain. Uh, I'd argue that's not where we want to go. Um, this one is uh, looking at, uh, again, the, the, the funding level, and just looking at the fact that uh, the, the success rates versus the time that you have to succeed is really putting in, in danger, um, you know, our, our faculty, our younger faculty today. Uh, and then we all know uh, the, the idea of, uh, of, of well-being that it takes to be able to survive a PhD is, is something that's becoming uh, really not tenable. If you go further, and this one actually was actually taken from um, Australian Academy of Science. Now, when you talk about the career progression uh, pipeline, um, this was just an illustration from this particular uh, uh, paper talking about all of the barriers that we face uh, in even once we've gotten um, our, our degree or whatever the credential is that is uh, required for our career. Uh, everything from uh, you know recruitment uh, issues. It, it could be lack of equity. It could be discrimination or biases. Uh, that really uh, trim the, the path to becoming that, that senior level researcher, which is the mythical academic, that right everyone's supposed to be uh, uh, a full professor uh, that's well-funded and in an endowed position. Um, uh, another tech thing is you could have the technology that could make you a superstar academic. It's kind of related to funding as well, um, but you could be really smart um, and, and be in the situation of which you have access to new technology methods because you're trained on them. Um, this is a look at machine learning publications. Uh, as you could see, if, you, if you're graduating more recently, you could be in a situation in which you have access to uh, technologies that are really hot right now. Maybe that will always happen, um, but it puts you in a really interesting situation. I really love this paper uh, talking about that particular uh, when we think about machine learning or AI or things like that, uh, that you, you have challenges there, but maybe that's something where some people succeed by virtue of the fact that they have access to that first and others are still waiting to get in. So 
the, those are all issues in academia, right? The funding levels, uh, the stress and the, the obstacles to actually getting that academic position and even um, the, the difference in technologies. But I think a lot of these things have been talked about. I, I do not by any means say that they've been solved. Uh, there's a lot of work to do with all of them. But at the very least, if I was to try to look for one positive, to be able to see that there's at least conversations around improving and equalizing funding, there are at least conversations around work-life balance, there's at least conversations around diversity, equity, and inc inclusion. Those are fantastic. Those are great. However, I think that there's a lot more work to be done, and there's something we haven't actually um, talked about, except maybe at places like where you are, which is a skill summit, so we are talking about it. Uh, what about training? How do you get a superhero who's well-trained? I could think of Beast, because uh, I guess he's actually known for being an academic. Uh, and, you know, how do you actually uh, think about training beyond the formal training that you get uh, in, the, in, in the, uh, you know, the ordinary course of your degree? And my thesis and what I'm here to talk a little bit about is the idea that um, in order to really be successful as a modern researcher, we need to really get serious and, 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 and think of new ways and open up conversations about career spanning training really thinking about the fact that the shelf life of skills that we get as not, not the myth, but the reality of what it's going to take to be uh, more successful when we talk about uh, our training today. Um, we did this study a little while back, which was discussing um, with uh, and surveying uh, researchers funded in our case by the National Science Foundation and asking them, what were the things that you most need to be more successful at dealing with uh, big data in our case? And all of them said that it was training um, that was the most important thing for them and the most unmet need in order to be able to, to deal with the, the realities of doing research today. Um, I found this article interesting, so I always cite it. Uh, this is by actually a pair of economists who really uh, characterized uh, the way that skill, skills work in STEM careers by saying that uh, it's not actually, they, they make the case, I didn't quote it in this particular quote, but they make the case that when we're always talking about the STEM pipeline, uh, I, that term gets used in many places, but they made the case that the STEM pipeline is not because the STEM workers are shortage, uh, in shortage, it's that the skills are in shortage. And in STEM, in, in our areas that we that people in this room cover, um, those skills get old quick, unfortunately. I wish they didn't, but it's kind of true. Um, this is the reality um, that, yes, not, not most of us are going into the traditional academic uh, setting, but uh, quite a number of us are taking the skills that are learned in academia and taking them into many other different places. And so it's, it's really important to get away from the mythos of uh, academia as being this single track, uh, this mythical um, origin story where everything turns out um, uh, comic but perfect, to really thinking about the realities of uh, we need to be able to not only uh, consider other factors like the training that you like the like the you know how you're supported by a funding agency or um, how we can improve the academic climate, but also the training that we need to actually support people across their whole career span. Um, because if we don't, uh, I wonder if we're not getting to an area where you end up with a scientific digital divide, where you, you just have a, a, a place where academics who were not able or un, unable to keep up, as that uh, interesting paper said, it's impossible to keep up maybe in some areas, it seems, uh, where we have a disconnect. Um, and how do we bridge that gap between that formal training, um, which will, I argue, never keep up because things will always continue to change, and how do we bring that into a sense of career span, career spanning learning and actually prioritizing the idea of career spanning uh, training? Because uh, the brain that we had um, decades ago, whoever graduated, the people that are sort of making decisions now, um, I, I'm starting to be allowed. I was, I'm a, from the, I guess from the 1980s, I'm starting to be allowed to make decisions. Not quite, but sometimes they let me um, do it. How do we actually deal, deal with scaling people? Um, because... Uh, we all have the same brain, um, 
more or less, at, at least we get hopefully uh, a chance to start on the same page. How do we scale people to do that? Um, so I had mentioned this one, I, I do bring back the quote, it looks like, where I say that if it's, it's the rate of change in STEM that drives this. And I brought that, sorry that these slides got repeated there. Um, and it's also really important because uh, it, it, it ends up being an issue of, of also uh, equity and inclusion and justice. And these are themes that we've talked about, uh, we talk about in other academic settings, but um, it's going to turn out that uh, the degree that you get from one university and the training that you get from one university may not be um, exactly the same as you could get from a different institution. And not being able to address faculty needs whenever and wherever they manifest themselves is an issue there that we have to uh, fight against. Um, so if I ask the question, how many of you have taken a workshop to improve your skills? I'm sure many of you, your hands would go up. And um, workshops are definitely one of the ways. Workshops, uh, uh, boot camps, uh, trainings, I think was mentioned in the, uh, in the intro, the carpentries uh, is one group that I am sure many of you have other uh, gotten, in, gotten involved in. Um, workshops and boot camps and short courses or what we call short format training is certainly a way that many of us actually look to to be able to get more of the skills that we need. And I'm sure it's also uh, something that's being thought about in that room uh, as a skill summit. How do we deliver those skills to the people that need them um, when they need them as they need them? Um, but what stopped me a few years ago or at least prompted me to give a lot of thought to this question was this particular paper, uh, which goes into the idea that a lot of what we may do in order to accomplish that training uh, may not be as effective as we, uh, as we imagine sometimes. Now, this particular paper uh, suggested, and it's not the only one or not the only reason or not the, the end of the question, that a lot of what happens in training might be ineffective. They did a, a longitudinal survey of several hundred students across many institutions uh, in this particular case, looking at a whole range of, of training that the students got to, to improve their computational skills, to improve their research presentation skills, their ability to, to write and, and, and deliver um, uh, papers and talks and articles. And they found that they, they, they couldn't find a difference between the students who had received those extra trainings and not. And they, they come to the conclusion that a lot of what we do for that type of training is not working. It's not effective. Um, that is certainly uh, something that could be explored, and it's open to interpretation to some extent. Um, but it, it was something that definitely started me thinking, and, and many other people too. So um, the work that I'm here really to talk about uh, after that lengthy introduction and trying to uh, give a little bit of setting the stage here is that uh, myself and a group of uh, uh, several other people have been uh, taking, it, taking it to heart uh, of how do we improve training. And uh, the project that we're working on, and hopefully soon to be published, uh, we're, we're, the manuscript draft is on my computer, waiting for the last uh, dottings of I's and crossings of T's, is uh, we've been working on a minimal set of principles for making that type of training uh, effective, inclusive, and career spanning. Um, the idea that we could take uh, what all of us do and really approach it in a, in a rigorous way to, to give us a higher degree of certainty, both us as instructors and also for our learners, that what we are delivering them is really going to be helpful and, and really have a good sense um, that what we're delivering uh, will make the impact that we hope. Um, and this is important because after your undergraduate degree, uh, the things, the, the way that learning works is so different uh, that it does merit a, a, a wide consideration, right? Um, as you go through your normal learning progression, you complete your undergraduate degree, you, you likely would complete a graduate degree in STEM, uh, maybe you have a postdoc which gives you an additional chance to, to learn, and maybe even you have in, in, uh, an internship or other opportunities. But when we're talking about how people really learn after that, that undergraduate setting, on the one hand, I guess, you could just assume everybody's smart. We're all researchers. We're all scientists. We're all smart. Uh, you're just going to learn things. Uh, but how do we actually learn? And, and you could see if this resonates with you. It's certainly based upon my own fears and aspirations and feelings. So uh, you can use this to analyze me. But oftentimes, uh, the learning starts when I'm 
looking at a talk, or listening to a talk, or reading a paper, look, looking at a blog, and I'm like, wow, that's interesting, that's important. I don't know how to do that. I need to know how to do that. Um, so that might be the first thing that the motivation for, for, for learning appears, right? Um, and then you may want to do something about it, signing up for an online course, taking a tutorial. Maybe that will be your next step. Uh, if you start to really get into it, maybe you start to subscribe to a YouTube channel. Obviously, we live in the age of, of those things. Um, completing any of those things or actually getting meaningful stuff, it depends. Sometimes you can. Um, but then what are other options? Uh, because then you start to realize, wait a second, I don't have even the time to work on this. Uh, maybe I'll be able to work with a student or a collaborator. Uh, maybe I can hire somebody who could do it. Um, maybe I can do it next year if I give myself more time. Uh, let me just go ahead and find any little detail that will get me to what I want to do today. Uh, and maybe we'll work about it next time. Uh, the other thing that I would do if I'm trying to learn something is follow people on social media uh, who are dealing with that challenge, and maybe I can learn something from them. Um, but if there's no other choice, then finally it comes down to uh, can I actually apply, and will I be able to apply what I learn in any of those things? Because that's the kind of key thing. Can I do that? Um, so that's very, very different because in, in short format training, I've only got hours uh, if I'm taking a workshop or being exposed to that to, to get to get any of that learning. Um, I'm really focusing. I really do get a chance or I'm looking for a chance for hands-on learning. Um, but when it comes to how those short format training workshops work, or if I'm thinking about my learners as an instructor, I know that the people that are coming to me, their prerequisites, they might be um, it difficult to, to sort of get people to understand what I need them to come to me with. And I can't make them come to me with those things. When I'm delivering short format training, um, the, the, instruct, the, the learners that I have, they have different needs, uh, which are quite heterogeneous. If I contrast that on the right uh, to what we're calling long format, or if you think about the type of instruction that you get in undergraduate, I've got quarters and semesters to deal with people. Um, I, I have a lot of time for lecture to give them uh, underlying concepts. I can really make sure that they have uh, prerequisites before they come to me, and then I, I can pre I can specify what what uh, learners need to do before they come to me. That's all on the learner side. When it comes to me as an instructor, or when it comes to the university that supports me or the institution that supports me, on the left hand side again with short format training, usually as an instructor I'm a domain expert and I don't necessarily know how to teach. Um, you hope, not always the case, but you hope that your instructors at the undergraduate or graduate setting do have some qualifications there. Uh, when it comes to regulations or the actual policies that my university uh, has, it could be everything from policies on how curricular design to policies on uh, how the room should be accessible. Uh, that's unlikely to happen in short format training, whereas in the normal classroom setting, there's usually standards, there's sometimes even legal requirements. Um, there's all of these, I won't, I, I don't need, I've read half the slide, but you get the idea that it's a, it's a really different uh, setting to do short format training versus long format instruction. And so uh, the group of us, uh, including some uh, wonderful folks in, in Australia, came together considering all of these methods. Uh, I put their names, or all of these considerations, all these problems, I'll put their names up briefly on the screen just to recognize them, because this is not just my work, uh, but, the, but the work of many, many people. Uh, what we came together were, were these principles, as I mentioned, I'm going to go into, because sometimes if you put 10 things down, uh, people will listen to you. So uh, writing down principles is a good thing to start with. So what are they? Uh, what are these principles that we came up with? Why should you listen? Why should you consider them? Well, we hope that the principles really uh, have taken in, because if you looked back a moment ago on the screen of, of the different uh, institutions and different groups uh, that were part of this group, um, the, the principles are really trying to be an international consensus to label and capture the best of what many training programs out there, maybe not all of them, but what many of them are doing. And also the idea of these principles would be to provide a path for individuals or for groups so that we could develop an experience, uh, try to think about how do, we uh, how do we shape short format training into something that anyone could 
anticipate how it would be structured, that they could be, I, I, I hate to use the word guaranteed, but they, they could have assurances that what they're getting in that short format training is going to be of a certain quality and hopefully, therefore, of a certain impact uh, and effectiveness. And then also, when we're thinking about short format training, uh, the idea here is to take values that we all have as instructors and practices, which we all believe in, and really make them um, highlighted because these things can get lost in the fact that if I tell you to take a semester's worth of content and try to deliver it in a couple days, you're going to have to make a lot of cut. And um, while obviously, yes, you do have to give whatever you can do in the time allowed, there are certain things that we don't want to lose because they're too important and we don't want them to be lost in sort of the, the, the short duration of the experience that we have to give them that. So let me give you, there's a set of core principles, there's four of them, and there's a set of uh, community principles. I'll explain them. And then I'm finally going to wrap up by coming to this idea of uh, how do we use all of this stuff to professionalize training, which is one of our recommendations. So um, let me go through the first four core principles first. Um, and we say that these are things that all short format training should do. Uh, the very first one is this idea of evidence or best evidence, uh, that when we design training programs, we need to ground them in, in what we know works from the education sciences. And also because oftentimes there are things that we know work because we have data, but may, may not always even be published. Uh, how do we actually also use the evidence uh, from formally evaluated instruction? So uh, uh, the absolute uh, bottom of the, uh, 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 of the list of the foundation that we put together. The second um, principle is this idea of what we developed the term catalytic learning. How do we, when we're designing a training workshop, how do we prepare learners to succeed when what we have to actually give them is not enough? Um, I think we often know that when we're training people, we can manage to convey a few skills, we can manage to convey a bit of knowledge, but oftentimes there's a lot more that they'll need to get um, after the classroom or after that experience, and they're going to be on their own. Um, they may need to take other courses, they may need to do some study, or they may need to just get out there and try it. Uh, so how do we prepare learners to be successful at self-directed study after um, the experience we give them? The next one is this idea of effectiveness. Um, this one always reminds me of the quote uh, that you cannot uh, change what you don't measure. A lot of times in short format training, uh, we don't do assessments and evaluations. Sometimes we do, and some programs do. Um, or sometimes there is some type of evaluation, but it's more of, was the experience positive? Did you enjoy the workshop? Was it too fast? Was it too slow? But this idea of effectiveness is the idea that we need to have the right assessment in, in, in place that actually demonstrates to the learner and to the instructor, but in this case, at least we're emphasizing the learner, that the learner has moved from point A to B in whatever the objective was to learn, uh, so the learning goal or the program. Uh, the programmatic goal may be things like we've created an inclusive space and learners, when they take our courses, uh, say that they felt included, say that they were able to access and use the materials. So that, that's the idea of providing that evidence and, and, and showing that what you're doing is actually effective. And the final core principle that we suggest all short format training should do is to be inclusive. And that really means taking time and doing due diligence to make sure that learners are able to fully participate in and benefit from the learning experience. Now, um, complementing those set of core principles, there's a smaller a set, three of them, of what we call community principles. Now, these apply when the short format training we're designing is not a one-off. It's not something um, that you're just doing once but it, it applies when you actually are going to start to take that training and, and, and get others to use and reuse it, to spread it, um, and to work together as groups so that large numbers of people could be impacted by that training. So uh, the first of these three community principles is REACH, which is principles surrounding the idea that you need to include new types and larger audiences of learners. So your original training format or materials or approach or methodology might need to be altered in order to reach new types of learners or larger numbers of learners. 
And you have to consider in the process of doing that, do you lose something? What do you lose? And can you afford to lose it? Because maybe you need to reconsider if you uh, compromise uh, the quality of the learning. The next one is the idea of scaling, which is how do you affect or impact or prepare the instructors and, and the instructional designers or developers so that they are able to take what you have built in one setting and scale it out. And the idea of sustainability, um, which could mean many, many different things. It could be the availability and the usability and the re relevance of training materials. Um, when do they expire? Uh, or how are they kept up to date? Uh, how reliable are they? What was the expertise of the people who put them together? And then how do you build infrastructures? And those infrastructures that support training materials or training programs could be the trainers themselves, but also the communities that allow them to be effective. So um, all of these things, and I, I, you might have heard allusion to uh, earlier this idea of the bi bicycle principles. Um, the reason why we use the word or use the bicycles metaphor is because you could think of these as iterative processes that feed off of one another, that form a cycle. And you could think of a unicycle as, hey, you know what? Um, if you are only doing uh, uh, a, a training or putting together an experience that's for a small group of people, limited time, only going to be done in one setting, um, that's fine. And you could stick to those core principles, unicycle, and, and that'd be fine to, to do it that way. But if you are going to scale up and scale out that training, how can you then think about reach and scale and sustain those community principles to have the full bicycle, uh, which is good for going far in this illustration. So um, you can take a look at this. Here's a, a, the second QR code. Uh, because all of these things, although the paper is uh, in, in drafting, um, all of the key findings are out on uh, the Bicycle Principles website. And I have just a little bit of time um, in the next few minutes to just tell you a little bit about some of those recommendations and focus on one of them, which is the idea of professionalizing what we do and how could that be achieved and what might be um, the incentives for doing something like that. Um, so some of the example recommendations that, that this group that I alluded to earlier came up with. Um, uh, well, each one of them, when you do go into the site, uh, as I present a couple of examples, summarizes what that recommendation is and gives you a very quick um, illustration of how this could work. It also says how their recommendations, which are specific instances of what we suggest, are related back to the principles. Um, and then also the entire group's ideas on how could this benefit the learner, so it's a bit learner-centered uh, centered intentionally. How could this be incentivized for the people who actually need to do the work? Sometimes that will be individual instructors, but a lot of times it might be groups of instructors, it might be institutions. And then what are potential barriers that we would need to overcome in order to make this real? Um, you can also, while you're there visiting, uh, give us feedback as to uh, what you think and do you think this could work. And as was mentioned earlier by Catherine, um, we've done some focus groups. There's one more happening in a, in a week or so. Uh, where we're going around to groups of people trying to get as many different opinions as we can um, to start to develop the evidence base that will allow us to uh, deploy this in, in many ways, both uh, we, meaning me, um, in, in my particular position, but really anyone who's interested in this because this belongs to the community, it came from the community. Uh, we'd love to support anybody who'd like to take this and make it better. So here are some recommendations. And because the recommendations are somewhat abstract. Uh, they are accompanied by images generated by artificial intelligence. Uh, many of you have played with these tools. Um, and rather than look for copyright-free images, uh, I've just always put prompts in. And so the prompt is underneath the image. I only pulled out three or four of these. Um, but one of the recommendations, uh, D, <clears throat> they're not in any uh, particular, particular order. But um, D is the idea of operationalizing equitable and inclusive um, practice as, as ethical, as an obligation. So again, if we walk into the classroom to teach, oftentimes we've had the whole support of the university, which has uh, really thought about what an accessible classroom means, has uh, perhaps an office in the university that's dedicated to accessibility standards, and has assistance for you as an instructor to make sure you meet those standards. But what we often find, uh, I have data here unpublished to, to demonstrate that, but I think 
uh, for those of you who do instruction, this will ring true, is that oftentimes when we do short format training, uh, we're not doing it within the formal university context, although we might physically be in the building. And so the idea of uh, inclusion and, ec and, and equity um, may be up to us. And if we're well versed in these areas and we're very conscious of them, we may do it well. Um, but if we're not, or especially if we're just putting on an informal workshop, we might not have considered this. Um, but this recommendation says that it really should be an ethical obligation. And um, it's, it's something that merits discussion. Uh, although we won't focus on this one today, it's uh, certainly worth a look. This other one uh, alludes to some of the issues I mentioned earlier, the idea of deploying training to counter inequity. And what is meant here is the idea of can we make sure that as we develop training programs or, or consider how we serve uh, members of the community, our colleagues, how do we do that in such a way that uh, we really serve those of our colleagues who are um, most at a disadvantage for not having gotten uh, that training? And it could, it could affect us and impact us in so many ways. Uh, for example, you know, um, people are busy, uh, work, training workshops happen. How many workshops happen at a time of day or in a situation or context where uh, our colleagues who are parents wouldn't be able to attend because they are taking care of family members? How would that work? Uh, have we considered that? Uh, if we don't consider that, are we perhaps disadvantaging um, those who have uh, who have children and perhaps even disadvantage uh, uh, putting at a, a, a more imbalance uh, women who oftentimes uh, take more of that responsibility and then may be less able to participate or take advantage of the training opportunity. That's just one example. Um, but there could be many, many more of how uh, the training needs to be thoughtfully deployed to make sure that we don't do it in a way that uh, unfairly um, disadvantages one group or another. Another one, um, and then I'll get to the one that I'll just focus on for a few moments, is this idea of standards. And the idea that can we communicate to our learners who might not really think about the quality of short format training, other than that they hope it's good, they hope it teaches them something, and they hope it's about what they want to learn at that moment to get them that next paper. Uh, how do we communicate to them that as we do things, we have thought about inclusivity, we have thought about uh, quality standards. Um, without such labelings, then really uh, the learner is only at the option to take whatever training is happens to be available or accessible. And as uh, services like um, ARDC and others start to compile training and compile opportunities, how can we communicate uh, the, not only necessarily the level of quality, but it could be the relevance of, of a training experience or the fact that one training experience has been more recently updated. It could be whatever uh, you consider as, as an important factor that you want to communicate to the learner. So um, the one that I, I'll spend my last few minutes on is this idea of professionalization. And what does that mean uh, to actually take what all of you in this room do and make it even more professional? Because I think you're probably already professionals. Uh, but what could it mean to actually think about um, training and short format training, not just as we held a workshop, not just as, well, Jason knows how to do this, uh, use this program, and therefore we'll get him to teach something to, to the rest of us, but something that really makes it uh, a little bit a notch above. How could we professionalize on the training? Well, we give a couple of examples. Uh, the first one is thinking about uh, the, 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 the network of people who do training. Uh, how do we create avenues for those people to develop an identity with that, with that role? and to, to realize and recognize other people who have that role and that we have a common role and have a venue to disseminate our work, uh, to develop our practice and become better, and also to reward those of us who make contributions to the space of training, however um, we participate in that role. And currently, I think that many different uh, groups or professional societies have uh, some element of them or some uh, section within them that is devoted to training. But what if instead of being a special interest group within uh, a society or an organization, the idea of short format training itself could be independent and cross-cutting uh, as a professional community. Um, these are elements that help professionalize. And then if there were, were such a thing, perhaps even 
uh, short format training community of practice or a short format training professional society, what are some of the roles that such a group could do? Because a lot of it would be not necessarily disciplinary specific. Uh, it wouldn't matter if you're doing this for physics or biology or medicine or etc. But together, as we think about what does it mean to make uh, to deliver impactful training um, that meets all the criteria, the principles to our colleagues uh, as we serve them in the role of, of instructor and training, when together we could think about how do we vet, curate, and maintain centralized resources? How do we clarify, identify, address challenges that we all share? And then as we do that, how do we share those innovations so that we can all become more effective, inclusive, and career-spanning? Um, there are a number of incentives that could uh, make uh, the effort that will take to reach that level of professionalism worthwhile. Um, one of them for instructors would be really recognizing and celebrating the contributions of people in this room. Um, and for every instructor to say that the role that you have within the community of, uh, of you know, academics, within the scientific community, is invaluable. Um, because without the ability to be effectively trained for our, our career span, and without the ability for everyone to be included in that process, um, you know, it, 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 science is not going to advance as quickly as it could otherwise. And then, as a community, uh, you can rely upon your peers for support, and you can really have that community sense. For people who are um, also including, let's say, the instructional designers who might not be at the, the face of the instruction, but who organize it, or administration, or other uh, of us are doing independently could be done, done more successfully together. And how do we have new opportunities to develop better and more sustainable economic models? Uh, because there are models, um, you know, that really depend upon free labor, which is not a nice thing to do if we can avoid it. But at, at the same time, we need to think about the fact that it does cost time, money, and effort to deliver these things. How could we do that better together? And then for funders, uh, and other organizations who also have a role in supporting this training, uh, working with such a professional society or professional societies or groups could strengthen the justification for short format training and allow the funders to shape and, and raise the bar for quality um, for multiple groups, but focus through the activities of a single organized uh, professional group. So, the thought there really, um, just painting that very, very um, in the clouds vision, but one that I think has uh, some elements that really could be made real. Um, we need to take these ideas and we need to build communities around them. Uh, we need to sense these problems as a group and then think of solutions that we can act on together. Um, community of practice is one of the ways that this happens. Uh, there, are, there are methods, uh, but this is certainly one of them, where by coming together and talking about these topics, uh, we can support each other uh, in many different ways to make sure uh, that we raise the level of quality and, in, and in, in the impactfulness of our training. I'll throw a selfish pitch for a way that I've tried to help contribute to this, uh, which is a group uh, called Lifeside Trainers at lifesidetrainers.org where we definitely try to realize some of this idea by bringing together people who do short format training uh, across many different groups uh, with the opportunity and the, and the idea of, of making training better. And we have uh, a monthly call. You can go and take a look at that. Uh, it happens twice so that we include people in multiple time zones, including in Australia. So my final thought with that is that uh, we definitely need to build community around these ideas so that we can sustain the solutions. So I hope I've given you something to think about. Um, I know personally that there's, there's a lot there to, to grasp, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I think that it's, it's a critical uh, tool for, for conversations that you're having. And I, I was looking at the Skill Summit, um, just amazed by the, the diversity of topics I see you're gonna be addressing um, to really think about how do we do this across the career? How do we do this as a group? And what is the role of that shorter uh, format of training experience that could be improved, that could be made more impactful, and that, that could really be, be delivered to everybody to accelerate science? So with that said,
I hope there's time for questions, uh, and I hope that it starts some ideas and conversations, because what you do is so important. Um, and I, I hope that in some way the work of these groups uh, that I've been able to present uh, stimulates you to think a little bit further on that. So thank you for the invitation, and I'll take any questions uh, that come from it. Thanks, Jason. Um, absolutely fantastic presentation. Thank you so much for that. And certainly you have raised some, um, you know, flagged some very um, pertinent topics that no doubt we will all be um, discussing over the, the next couple of days. Um, does anyone have a question? Well, while you're thinking about a question or a couple of questions. Um, Jason, I was, you mentioned communities of practice and earlier in your talk you talked, um, you spoke about the effectiveness of short form training. And I was just wondering how, do we, we, do we measure the, the effectiveness of communities of practice? Um, you know, and is that on, on people's radar? Because I know it is actually on the ARDC's radar and we have a community um, strategy that we, we've worked through. Uh, and so, yeah, I was just wondering, from your perspective, do you kind of measure um, communities of practice and, wh and what impact, impact they're actually having? Okay, I will admit that for whatever reason, you were crystal clear a few, a few minutes ago and then just now not so. And it's not that you're not near the microphone, oh, um, but yeah. I, do take it, I, I do take it that your question was about community of practice and the potential for that to have an impact. Is that sort of the gist of the question? You had more to it. Yeah, so I... essentially how you if you, you um, measure the effectiveness of a community of practice. Okay, I, I thought maybe I got something there about uh, how could you envision that happening, if that's right. Otherwise, someone will chat. <laughs> I see the chat opening, so they, they will, they will, cor they will uh, correct for me and I'll enrich my answer as I start to talk about it. Um, so community of practice is an interesting um, how to measure the effectiveness of the community of practice. Oh, great. Um, community of practice is an interesting thing because uh, uh, on the one hand, it sounds so simple um, that, hey, groups of people get together and they get better at what they do. Um, but there are actually people, um, and I can throw um, a, a shout out, so to speak. And in fact, since I can share my screen, uh, let me just pull up one thing that I think is so important and so valuable because your question kind of revolves around the idea of how will we even know if we're succeeding? Um, we could put together, quote unquote, a community of practice, but if we don't know um, how to measure that and how to uh, understand in a, in a sort of rigorous way, then we might do something that's positive and it might feel good, but it may not actually get us somewhere. Can I throw uh, a, th a thought to the group and uh, a really celebrate of one of the persons is actually involved with this uh, group uh, and this is the Center for Scientific Collaboration and Community Engagement, um, who deal with, among other things, community of practice. And I wanted to draw their attention and, and use this, please, in your conversations. Have a look at it. And again, I'm leaving after this talk, but you are continuing on for, for some days. Um, they have this interesting community participation model. Um, so communities evolve. And actually, there's a number of theory uh, and papers on this idea where you can go through a cycle of people who have an idea like me today, uh, and you uh, are at the stage of where you're, I've conveyed something to you and you've taken it in. Great, that's step one. But at a certain point, the community needs to change where now it's not about me broadcasting to you, but it's about people now starting to actually come to make contributions. And that's something that could be measured. And then the next stage of that, evol uh, of that evolution is the idea of collaboration. Now people are working in small groups or in different units on those ideas. And then ultimately it ends up with the idea of co-creation. Now those individual groups are creating something new. And there are metrics and, 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 and qualitative and even I would argue quantitative uh, milestones along that progress. So I think that community of practice could be more than this sort of soft fuzzy thing that, oh, we are a community of practice, but could actually be made into both um, something that is qualitatively and quantitatively measurable. And there are people who have expertise in that sort of even network science to measure 
um, by the outputs of the community and by the actual activities it's undertaken, is this successfully evolving as a community of practice where we see that the outputs are, are what we intended? And can we measure that? Or if it's going off co course in certain ways, can we intervene along that process to make sure that it's following the course and do so in a way that's convincing and, and measurable? So I think that that is possible. Um, and I think that would be a wonderful thing for all of us, myself included, to think about how when we use that term, how can we apply that standard so that it's not just a, a, a buzzword or a theme that, that gets labeled. Thanks, Jason. Any questions? Hi, Jason. Thanks so much for your um, presentation today. Um, I have two questions, and they're completely different questions. And the second one you might not be able to answer. Um, my first question is, is there any other way to engage a number of training uh, trainers across a campus apart from a community of practice? Because um, I'm kind of new to this area. And when I was doing research, I was finding there was a lot of the same training offered in a variety of different centers or faculties. And it was very much a silo situation. Um, so that was my first question. My second question is, a lot of this short format training is offered free. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any advice on how to ensure people that sign up for the training actually attend, because <laughs> there is a problem with commitment. And um, it kind of irks me, to be honest, because especially if you're paying for catering and they just don't yeah, I don't know. People don't have a conscious, and then they just don't turn up and tell you. So, yeah. Yes, okay. Um, let me start with the second one first. I, I can give an answer, and there's actually uh, one of our recommendations, um, which is on um, the list there, is a recommendation G, which is to clarify the economic models that enable SFT. It's kind of, it sounds a little bit of a, I don't know, politician speak, um, but it, it, it does go into that idea that uh, because something is free, oftentimes there's a perception that it's not valuable or that it's not, you know, worth your time or, and, 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 and not mending the learner's time. I mean, like you said, you've planned for it, you've booked it, you saw 50 registrations come in, you, you paid for the really expensive coffee, and then six people show up. Um, not to mention the fact that we have lots of things going on, everything from pandemic burnout and how do you deal with that. I mean, my, my way in sometimes is actually you do charge and you charge a nominal amount just to have an investment that people come into it, um, that they, you know, or, or they lose their $25 or whatever nominal fee. Uh, that's an operational question that we could ask and people could come up with recommendations. But, but the idea of it, the larger issue that we put around that idea, that's what you've mentioned is one specific instance of the idea of learners didn't value it, right? And it lost, you know, it wasn't taken seriously. So we do mention that, um, and, and, and I would encourage you to read what's written there under G, because I, our, our, our thing was really we need more work on that. Um, how do we do that in such a way that we honor the time and value of everybody more than what we do? Because on the other hand, we need to balance with the idea that we want things to be accessible. We don't want someone who couldn't afford even maybe the $25 to say no to the training. So we have some suggestions on, under item G, and it's something that is a larger discussion. Uh, and and I'll, I'll just leave that thought with saying we, it's, it's connected to other discussions which have been well thought out, uh, which is everything from the idea that why is reviewing, peer reviewing in academia free and what should you do about it? So there is some thought about this. We make recommendations and then it's up to people to say the people that want to do those recommendations well, we, we can we can we can work with you, and the people who never want to implement them, okay. Going back to your your other question, and see if I can restate it and remember it, but it was essentially the idea of how do you deal with training happening in silos? How do you deal with the idea of training is being replicated in multiple different places, um, and and things aren't coordinated? 
Uh, well, to one extent, uh, that can also happen. This goes back to academic structures where there are perverse incentives, uh, where it's somebody's job to deliver the training, and they just deliver it, regardless of how well, it, you know, how much it's needed or not. Um, they, they delivered it. But I think the, the deeper thing is if people aren't connected, then they may not realize that what they're delivering is uh, is already been well put together by someone else, and there's no need to repeat it, or there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, there, there are. I, I, let me try not to get deep into just jargon and 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 speak or whatever, because the paper is in my head that we're writing right now. But one of the things that we found in in education reform is that there are two ways that you get. There's, there's a thousand ways that you get people to change, but there's two that come up most often. One of them is community of practice, is as a method for education reform. That's one that comes up more often than others. And the second one that comes up more often is the idea of um, diffusion of innovation, going back to Rogers. And some will be familiar, some not, but if you've ever heard the phrase early adopter, that idea that there's a cycle of when something new comes in, some people adopt it, People have to be persuaded to use it. People have to have knowledge to use it. And another one of those elements in the diffusion of innovation cycle is people need to know that what they want to use is customizable um, because they always want something that looks like what you have but just slightly different because I'm special and I've got something different. You may, you may well be. Um, so helping people to identify what's out there through, for example, I know Dressa is coming online, the digital research, um, the, the, these different portals, that type of infrastructure could raise awareness and help other people know what has been offered or what's been done before. Physicists instead of physicians. Um, that might help. Um, to reduce some of the redundancy or the, or, or the isolation of people's efforts thinking they're the only one who've come up with something or who delivered something or customized it. So <clears throat> if people can feel connected or know that there's that resource that, that documents those things, and that's actually one of the principles, documenting what you've done and sharing it, making that easier, uh, hopefully that can reduce that uh, and free up people to do something that is more worth their time uh, when it comes to being creative, rather than just not being aware and having created something or spent a lot of time that was already well done and could have perhaps been put together rather than um, done independently. I hope that answers uh, some of your questions. If not, my contact information is all over everything. <laughs> I'd love to have a chat. I'm just in here. Hi, Jason. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, in you in the early slides that you do you presented you, there's a there's a need for a lot of data skills and software development skills and this is an area where a lot, where there's a lot of talk of micro credentials uh, because of the need to develop to to develop more skills at the faster rate although i haven't have you seen a successful implementation of how a micro credential system work? Sure. Um, so one of our, you'll be happy to know, one of our recommendations C is supporting micro-credentialing. Although in our case, we're talking about providing micro-credentialing for, for our instructors. If you're talking about micro-credentialing for learners in general, um, yes, that has happened. Here's my perception of it. I've even had that discussion in Australia where part of it, there, there you go back to the academic system. It's almost like there are, let me just say, I guess I could say that without getting in trouble. There are some universities who don't think micro-credentials should exist um, because why would you? We're, we're a famous university and we, give, we, we create well-rounded people uh, who know everything. So why micro-credential? Um, so I will, my, my perception having talking, 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 having spoken to many people is that there are actually some universities which are hostile to the idea. But there are other universities which are super excited about the idea of micro-credentialing because it does exactly what I, I think of a micro-credential do. It recognizes that there are bits and pieces of really needed skills that um, aren't quite represented in a formal course of study and which we need to deliver to somebody because they're interested, but also 
that person needs to be able to demonstrate, for example, to an employer that they are competent and qualified in a particular area so that the micro-credential means something. So I've definitely seen micro-credentials. The way that the system works here in the U.S., and I don't know exactly the equivalent in Australia, but here we would um, say that community colleges, which are usually institutions devoted to two-year degrees, and which oftentimes are very well connected with um, the needs of employers at the level of industry, where they work with an employer or with a group or with a specific field to say, hey, we want our students to be able to work at institution or job X. What are the five things that you that you look for in your new employers, uh, employees and teach exactly to that? Um, and that is a system that I've seen work. Um, it takes time, but and I think it's becoming more popular. But because it's so tightly coupled to a job, that, that, that the learner has confidence will likely be there for them if they acquire that micro-credential that the employer or employers have had input into so that they know that that micro-credential is teaching exactly to the skills that they'd like to see. Those, I think, are, 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 are fairly effective. Um, and I, I think there's growing evidence for it. It's, it's still a, maybe a relatively new concept. Um, but I think it's entirely the, you know, possible to be successful but I will say that it, there are institutions that don't like that idea. Um, and so there may be structures or, or, or groups of people who resist it or, or downplay it. But I think, it's a, I think it's a valid way. And if you think about, again, the whole idea of short format training, sorry to make this long, is that most of us are not going to go for a sabbatical in a new area. We don't have the time. Um, but a really well-designed micro-credential and when we need a little bit more than just a short course or webinar, but we really actually want to be quite skilled in that area, that might be a perfect uh, solution to do this. Um, and, if, if, you know, as a researcher, that might be something that we should be socializing and popularizing as a researcher. Maybe I need a micro-credential in Bayesian statistics because I really didn't get that. Maybe I need to get this uh, for this new type of analysis or for machine learning for biologists to do X, Y, or Z. That would be perfect. I want to know exactly what I want to know uh, what I need to know as a biologist in this area, and I want to be protected from all of the extraneous information and learning that I don't need um, because I'm not smart enough to know what I what I don't know and what I need uh, going in. I want somebody to package that for me in a micro-credential. So that's, that's my particular view. Thanks. <clears throat> Sorry. Thanks, Jason. Um, we have now reached time. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and look, if you do have questions for Jason, we're quite happy to collate them and send them through, and we can sort of um, distribute those to everyone who's registered. Um, otherwise, um, as Jason said, uh, reach out to him directly. Uh, there's plenty of ways of doing that. So thank you. Thank you so much. I know you're going to have a great conference, and so uh, enjoy the conference. Without further ado, we've got uh, five presenters this morning, um, four here in the room and one joining us via Zoom. So I'm going to get them to introduce themselves and we're going to start with Pablo Franco. Thank you very much and thanks for having me today. Um, I'm Pablo, I'm a postdoc at the Centre for Brain and Mind and Markets at the University of Melbourne. As I briefly described before, I have some experience teaching uh, digital skills, in particular R. At the university, we've been basically we're a group of researchers teaching researchers how to code. Um, and I'm now moving on and doing that at a faculty level. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you about assessing the effectiveness of training from a practical uh, perspective and teaching in the context of teaching, teaching digital skills to researchers. So. It's going to be very brief. The outline is in three different um, parts. The first one is the theoretical framework and how my own experience maps into that framework. And then I'm going to finalize with some ideas on how we can actually move forward and maybe things that you've already implemented and things that we'll be happy to discuss later on uh, in the summit. So to start with the theoretical framework, there's a, a framework you've probably heard of. It's called the Kirkpatrick Model of Training Evaluation. And it has uh, four components. Basically, says that you can um, assess effectiveness based on four pillars: 
reaction, which is how learners react to the training, the re relevance and usefulness of the training. So that's their own subjective experience. Uh, also, then we have the learning. So the participants, the students, uh, reach their learning object objectives. So that can be objectively measured with tests, for instance. The third pillar is behavior. So the um, students or learners uh, change their behavior in their day-to-day -day work. So for researchers, they, they, they perform, do they are, they're performing research differently. Have they improved their research, the quality or quantity or efficiency of their research? And in terms of results, this is the last pillar. And it, one which I think we need most uh, work is measure objectively the impact that that, had, that has at an institutional level. So um, can we quantify the results to society and in terms as well as research output? Um, and this is like the standard Kirkpatrick model of training evaluation that's quite widely used. And I propose that for our, uh, for our, did I, okay, sorry. I don't know if you were seeing all four pillars um, a second ago. Um, I propose there's one more pillar that we should include uh, for, our, uh, for our purposes, which is outreach. And that is the extent to which the training is being deployed. So who are our researchers? Who are we reaching? Uh, which disciplines are we reaching? Are we reaching people from all stage careers? So in terms of outreach, it kind of talks to the inclusivity and diversity of the people that we are teaching. Uh, so with that modification of the Kirkpatrick model of training, I can talk about my own experience at the University of Melbourne um, in, the, in my team or our team at uh, research um, platforms at Research Bazaar, uh, which we um, ran a few years ago, uh, not, unfortunately not anymore. Uh, but what I've, we've done in my own experience talks to four of those pillars uh, that I just described, one being the outreach uh, pillar. So in terms of how we measure that, we looked at the number of researchers, the diversity of the researchers, the disciplines, where they're coming from, who were we teaching. We were looking at the career stages of the people we were teaching. So we, provide, we asked participants to fill in surveys about all these kind of things. And then it, that helped us understand who we were not reaching. So which disciplines needed more effort, who, which career stages needed, um, we needed to focus on reaching as well. Um, and a bit, uh, this came out of also from the pandemic, as we moved into e-learning, we looked into um, assessing through number of views of either videos or uh, number of reads of books or blog posts that we faced, uh, that we, that we uh, posted. In terms of the other pillars, in terms of the reaction, we surveyed participants in terms of qualitative and quantitative uh, feedback they could provide about how their experience was that helped us improve our own um, workshops and trainings. And in terms of the learning pillar, then we did doing, uh, doing training exercises and quizzes that we actually were able to see the results. Uh, we use Kahoot, Bull, everywhere, but there are probably many ways that you can do this. And one which I think I'm most proud of is um, behavior. So for that, we actually called people that had trained with us after a few months or even a year and ask them, how did your, how did, you, did this training, I'll keep on anyway, um, how did this training help you uh, change your behavior in terms of research? So we had interviews in which they um, very detailed, in a very detailed fashion told us about how the training had actually changed their way of doing research. And this is my experience, but I think there's plenty of things that can and could, should be improved. Um, and especially for assessing impact objectively on the last three pillars. So in terms of learning, um, this is something that was talked to today before as well. We would need some objective measures of pre and post training test. How much did we actually improve in terms of the learning objectives based on how they came into their classroom? Uh, in terms of behavior, um, uh, a suggestion here would be maybe uh, do surveys and interviews not only with learners, but also with stakeholders, supervisors. Did supervisors notice that something changed in the behavior of, uh, research, of researchers? Colleagues, did people think that their colleagues are becoming more efficient as they, are, uh, as they um, attend our trainings? And also IT teams, um, and here IT teams, I'm being a very generic term, 
to uh, refer to people that might have access to information about um, the change in use of high computing services uh, on software licenses and so forth. And finally, uh, in the pillar that we haven't worked on is in the pillar of results, impact of outcomes. Uh, we can consider, for instance, improvement in the efficiency of output generation, so quantity of uh, research output and number of papers, or the quality of that research output by looking at a number of citations or altmetric metrics of the uh, the altmetric uh, metrics of papers. And uh, one idea that I had that might be interesting to look at was to encourage explicit acknowledgement of training on research output. Just like funding is acknowledged in papers, why wouldn't training be acknowledged? That will help us quantify and argue for the importance of our services. And with that, these are the references of the Kirkpatrick model. And thank you, and receive any questions. Hello, so we've got time for a couple of questions. If anyone would like to ask Pablo. Yep. Hi, uh, thank you for that, that was really cool. Um, I had two, sort of two questions. So the one was around essentially sort of the scalability of using a model like this. So do you do this for say every sort of training round that you have or is this something that you do sort of periodically like once a year, once every two years or something like that? In particular, I mean, some of the stuff I can see being applied very, very easily, like the, the, the engagement stuff at the beginning and stuff, but in particular where you sort of interview the students and their supervisors and everything, that would be a very labor intensive thing that I can't imagine doing all the time. Um, so that was the one question. The second one is, um, and this, I'm maybe getting into the weeds here a bit too much, but in terms of the sort of sort of the linking, the I love the idea of linking the training, but in the same way that you would link the funding and sort of assessing it around like things like citations and everything. But I suppose the question is, how do you draw, how do you draw the, that sort of explicit link between this person attended the training and that's sort of led to the higher citations? Because they might come to one training course, be sort of a you know a high achiever originally, they learn something at the training course, but they were going to get those citations anyway. Do you, you know what I mean? Like it's, and I'm not trying to dispel the training or anything. I'm just sort of curious as to how do you measure that? Yeah, no, I think that both are really good questions. Um, the, the first one, um, I do think that uh, it has depends on the amount of resources that you have at hand. So um, how much can you actually report on? How much time do you have to actually figure out and measure things? Um, what we did actually was like in sort of on a yearly basis to do the big, um, the big interviews and. Um, but we did have, and the big interviews and the outreach kind of analysis, but we did, we did have surveys after each, after each training on uh, things that we could change for that training. And we asked every time people uh, attended our training about their demographics in terms of career stage, discipline, and so forth. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I see you like for supervisor and all these surveys, it might be quite time consuming, so I wouldn't do it on more than a yearly basis. Um, of course, if you have the resources, yes. On the second question, I think it's more tricky. Um, I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> um, I think it's the trickiest question because it's, it's always going from the subjective value of our training based on what people think. And if they put it in, in the research output, great. Uh, but did it actually help them? Or it's just like the, that they think it helped. So maybe some sort of research that is well designed that allows us to control for all of these other factors and look at two different groups would be a way of actually justifying um, to funding <laughs> agencies for our services. Okay, I think we'll just move on to the next speaker and then we might have some um, questions uh, time at the end. So thank you, Pablo. Thank you. And up next we have Aidan Wilson. From Intersect. Thanks, thanks, Doris. Um, just going to switch across my presentation. Um, while that's happening, I'll start introducing myself. Um, so my name is Aidan Wilson. I'm the um, I'm Intersect's Digital Research Services Manager. Uh, wait, I might have to. Got it? No, nope, hang on. Got it. Okay. Uh, so I am Intersect's Digital Research Services Manager, um, and administration and um, sorry, administration and delivery of training is in my remit for that job. Before that, uh, I was digital research analyst for seven years working at a number of members, but mostly Australian Catholic University and 
uh, from when I started, I, I, I got involved in the training systems and administration from very early on. So I'm speaking today from um, personal experience. So at Intersec, we run probably the largest research technology focused short course program in the country. Uh, we deliver hundreds of courses each year to our member universities and other partners, and they are attended by thousands of researchers. Training courses are primarily delivered um, uh, oh, I should mention the topic. The topic I'm talking about, sorry, is uh, running training at scale and, um, and succession planning. Um, uh, hence, talking about the, the, the size of the program. Um, uh, so training courses are primarily delivered by our team of digital research analysts, augmented by a large team of casual trainers spread around the country, and I'll talk about them more in a moment. Um, our members continue, continually tell us that they value our training program very highly, along with the digital research services we provide via our digital research analysts. So on that basis, as well as some of the other evaluation metrics that are up on screen now, um, that we collect um, both after every training course and also uh, uh, sometimes a year later in, in, in blocks going to Pablo's uh, talk as well, I can confidently say that we do a very good job of delivering training. As you can see from this graph, our training has scaled up dramatically since inception of the program in 2012 really 2013, 10 attendees in 2012. Um, and they were all intersect people, by the way, in, in, in those 10 people. Um, and so this was, this was only possible through continual improvement of our training administration systems. Um, and when I came on board, which is when we started scaling up and looking at more systems, uh, automation is a hobby of mine. So uh, when I came on board and we were doing things very manually um, with uh, the DRAs, um, booking in courses, uh, uh, looking to fulfill them with trainers, the Intersect office admin creating Eventbrite events, booking routes on campus and making travel arrangements for trainers. Um, that, just, that kind of manual operation just cannot scale and I, I saw that and said we need more systems for this. So um, as we started growing from 2016 onwards, we began organising courses using a system of um, uh, sounds a bit janky, but uh, using a system of connected Google spreadsheets and applications that either semi or fully automate most of the effort in administering training courses. We call this the combined training, combined training forward schedule. It's not a, not a great, uh, not a catchy term, or CTFS. Um, the CTFS provides our DRAs with an annual view of all their courses, generates calendar entries, Eventbrite pages, and automatically pushes courses to our website for external visibility. Without systems like this, we would be totally unable to, in the time that we have, um, uh, uh, the people that help me on this are also DRAs, so they, they're doing this kind of in their spare time from their university. So we would be unable to run this many courses without the systems that we have um, in place. But the computational systems um, are just one piece uh, of the overall platform. The vastly more important part is our people. This includes the entire team of digital research analysts, based on site at our member universities who take on ownership and primary responsibility for planning and delivering the program of courses at the university, um, as well as a subcommittee of DRAs uh, that we call the training and admin team, led by me, uh, who oversee the planning and also manage the allocation of the, uh, the, the most important piece, which is our team of casual research trainers. Um, we would be totally unable to deliver all of our courses without the assistance and often the leadership of our digital research trainers. The trainers assist DRAs in running courses, but often lead the courses themselves, particularly when the DRA uh, doesn't have the expertise in that particular tool, um, which with a large catalogue as ours is, uh, is actually very common. No one person can be across the extent of the, of the catalogue that we offer. This team has grown over the years, and this snapshot of 15 people is only those trainers currently working with us. Um, they are all current PhD students. Um, and we find that the work that we offer really suits PhD students very well. Um, training for us demands flexibility over the course of the year that uh, PhD students are able to live with because you know, if they've got training on a Tuesday, they can do their research on the Wednesday and, and vice versa. Um, uh, so this flexibility fits well with the requirements of completing a research degree. More importantly, the salary we pay for delivering training is commensurate with casual tutoring at a university. Uh, and the work itself encourages the trainers to build um, their computational skills that they can then apply to their own research. In short, our trainers are paid to develop their own skills in research relevant technologies. As one trainer put it in a recent catch up, the salary is really good and is on topics that are of interest. Some other PhD students are working as, for example, Uber drivers or doing casual work that has nothing to do with their degree, their knowledge or interests. Our trainers thus tend to stick with us throughout their degrees, which is also critically important for the succession. 
um, it means um, that we don't have a lot of the churn that, that um, others may, may face in having to train up new starters. So we have people that stick with us literally for two, three years sometimes. Um, and so they build a body of knowledge and they become the senior trainers that train up the junior trainers over time. Um, and it's a, it's a model that works very well. And we go through rounds of recruitment at the start of every year and we're about to start another round of recruitment, particularly in tools like uh, humanities tools like Invivo to lighten the load on Paul Catherine who's doing a lot of Invivo training for us for other universities. So if you know anyone who wants to work for us delivering Invivo training, get in contact. Um, uh, also, many, um, many of the, our trainers eventually come to work for us uh, full-time as DRAs, as data scientists uh, and HPC support specialists after the completion of their degree. So there's quite a lot of career path in this as well. So to summarise, our experience of delivering training at scale and I have to say doing a good job of it relies on two important factors. Having mature systems in place that handle the day-to-day -day minutia of planning courses and having access to a workforce of confident, competent and supported trainers who are remunerated fairly for their efforts, providing continuity of service. Thanks. Thanks, Aidan. Any quick questions for Aidan before we go on to our next speaker? No? Yep. Um, thanks, Aidan. Um, you, you talked about, um, well, I'll, I'll just ask the question, I guess, straight out. Um, E-research analysts, as you know, those do change over a period of time and they're working um, specifically in institutions, so they're building a lot of institutional knowledge and, and that sort of thing. How do you capture that knowledge? Um, is there a handover process or is there some way that the e-research analysts are documenting mm. what they're doing, you know, to ensure that that knowledge stays within Intersect? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, uh, yes, good question. Um, there is... Uh, we, try, we try to do as much handover as possible, so the, the DRAs will report to a manager. I'm, I'm the manager of some of them at the moment. Jonathan here is the manager of the, of the rest of the team. So we're kept pretty closely clued into what they're doing on campus, but also on campus they report to um, a, you know, you know, someone largely in the research office, maybe IT or both. Um, so we um, encourage them to be very transparent with their managers on campus and, uh, and, and the handover is sort of a combination of just in Intersect and the local university. Um, so I guess there's a number of ways of doing that. There are occasionally um, instances where somebody leaves without doing a full handover. That's unfortunate, but it happens. And sometimes we have to sort of start that process again yeah. of building up that um, local expertise. Probably something we should work on to... to uh, I guess another element of, of um, working on that is uh, we have similar systems that I've been a part of building to track the stuff that DRAs are doing on campus, not relating to training necessarily, but research support yep. um, uh, projects and so on. So we're tracking more of that and we report on those things annually. We have done, we have been reporting on that annually for the better part of the last, last decade. Um, so in that reporting, there is naturally a lot of handover. So when somebody starts, one of the first things they do is read the last 10 years of annual reports to that university to get a feel for what has taken place. Mm. I hope that answers. The, and, and yes, we've got, we've got an internal sort of wiki for documenting um, some of those things to, to build a sort of knowledge base over time as well. Thanks, Catherine. <laughs> Thanks, Aidan. That was great. Thank you. Um, so our next speaker will be Paula Martinez from the ARDC, and she's joining us online. So the next one will be a Zoom presentation. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear an echo. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me to give this presentation. I'm Paula Martinez, Software Project Coordinator at the ARDC. I'm here with my community managers have to talk to you about building community. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which I work and live, the Brisbane River, uh, the Yagara and Turbo people. If you have interacted with me in the past, you might know that I funded and supported multiple communities throughout the years. Within my role at the ARDC in the software program, we have identified a gap and envisioned a new community to discuss research software visibility. I started with a landscape analysis. 
of related communities and group them in a dual axis graph. So horizontally, how much do these communities discuss research so far? And vertically, how much influence do they have to promote change? So we found our niche and defined our vision. The Visible Research Software Interest Group was formed to affect change by boosting the visibility of research software to improve how it is cited, published, and fair. Once the landscape analysis is completed, we need a participation model, and this is defined by the type of community. Here are some examples, and they all tackle challenges via a group of individuals. The next step is building a repertoire of tools and methods that will enable our vision, such as some of these ideas. For example, how does community production and co-development is facilitated? How does knowledge is shared, disseminated and amplified? This is all stimulated by deliberate coordination, generating a space for participative, interactive, spirited and fun interactions, which motivate eager participation and celebrate small victories. Creating report in the community. In our case, we also intended to be influencing and transcending. So we initiated our work by prioritizing being inclusive, non-linear and resourceful, enabling different models of participation where each individual is valued and recognized. For example, creating champion roles, ambassadors or advocates. For all of this, it's important to have a clear and accessible code of conduct. And one thing that I like to expand on is the ability to look back to move forward. Here are some examples of the Visible Research Software Interest Group success stories. We managed to attract the right audience by forming an influencing cohort, by clearly stating who should join the group. Then initially, we created an open online discussion forum as the main platform to discuss actions in a public and transparent way. However, we created the infrastructure before getting the participants. So this work yet not in the active way that we intended. So we changed. We proactively invited people to communicate via an alternative way, the mailing list. We know that change takes time and we are still in the process of enabling participative, interactive, spirited and fun interactions. To finish celebrating small victories, in the almost one year since its inception, we have increased awareness of national and international guidance to improve the, the visibility of research software by sharing existing resources. Our initial report has been viewed more than 600 times and downloaded half of those. And we also continue to work on five short-term actions, one of them being the report on how researchers find software. And in the last three months, it's been downloaded 150 times. We're also getting important collaborations to leverage uh, in the future. That's all for me. And I'd like to point out a few resources that you should be aware when thinking about building communities. One is the ARDC communities and groups. The second one is FIBA B. The third one is the Center of Scientific Collaboration, Community and Engagement, CSCCE, and the Carpentries Communities. If you, if you haven't heard about them, I'm sure you will learn more about them at the end of this summit. Uh, thanks for your attention. Feel free to contact me via the general ARDC contact email and subscribe to our newsletter. Thanks, Paula. Any quick questions for Paula before we move on? Okay, Paula, thank you. Um, and the next speaker is Mark Crow from QCIF. Are you okay too? Are you okay? Okay. I've got a couple of slides coming, so hopefully they'll be arrive in a minute. Cool. And um, while they come up, um, so I'd just like to introduce myself. Um, I'm Mark Crow. I'm the Skills Development Manager for QCIF. I'm based up in Queensland. Uh, so QCIF provides research computing support services to all the Queensland universities. 
Um, so what, I think something like 20, 30,000 researchers we, we cover. Um, and the skills development side of things, um, we have trainers, we have a team of e-research analysts, very much parallels what Aidan was explaining earlier on about um, Intersect, and we have a very similar model within QCIF. Um, and yes, I agree, he's, they're the biggest providers of um, digital training in Australia. We're, we, we probably, we're, probably, we're probably second place. <laughs> so, good. Um, but I'm not going to talk about our, our um, workshop program today. What I'm going to do is talk about another area we um, focus on in skills development, which is ResBAS. Um, and in particular, bringing, oh, that's the, I was going to, I'm down in, the, down in the program as bringing training to research communities. And I say, I'll just change, change my title on the way down to bringing training communities to research, because really that's what ResBaz is all about. It's about creating a community, um, and the idea of that community is the way people can learn and grow their skills together, um, not only during the events, but really importantly afterwards. So taking those con con connections away to continue their learning and training opportunities. Oops, and that's what I mean by community. So this is just, this is a few shots of our ResBaz events. Um, so Pablo has already mentioned ResBaz, um, but didn't really explain a lot of detail what it was all about. Uh, so those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, it's short for Research Bazaar. So Research Bazaar describes itself as a festival promoting digital literacy. Um, so made up of a, a mixture of workshops, talks, networking events and social activities. Um, and it's not a conference. Um, it is a festival and that choice of the word festival really emphasises um, that, that it's bigger and more, there's more going on than just a conference. Um, specifically, a festival is a community event. You go to any festival, it's a community activity. Um, and we feel it's that community mindset that really makes, to makes me think that ResBaz is so effective because it encourages everyone who's there to get actively involved. But a conference, people may just sit there and listen. ResBaz is all about participation. Um, so I'm in Queensland last year in November, we had about 300 enthusiastic young researchers, um, and me and a few other less young researchers. Um, and everyone there was working together, they were learning together, um, they were networking, and really importantly, they were making friends. Um, and so for me, it's those social interactions, which are the really important things from ResBaz, much more so than the specific training workshops they're going to. Um, we, what we want from ResBaz is to, to create the connections that these people are then going to go away and these connections will grow into long-term re relationships where people are training each other, they're supporting each other, and eventually they're collaborating together. Um, so just an example of that, um, situation that happened at the uh, ResBaz in November. Um, I, I was chatting to one of the, the attendees there at um, our 90 Seconds of Research Impact event. So this is a show, social event we have at um, ResBaz. Um, slight three-minute thesis, but for people with a short attention span. <laughs> Um, and he was telling me about a workshop he'd been to earlier on in that day. Um, and what he said was that he was so enthusiastic about the workshop, the topic was there, straight after the event, he went up and sought out the instructor, had a chat with the instructor. Two weeks later, he was in the lab of this instructor up in University of Queensland, discussing collaboration and project opportunities. So really, from that one single interaction created by ResBaz, those people, they could now be working together for months or years. He'll be learning more from that instructor. The instructor will be learning from him, and probably people in their groups are going to be learning from each other as well. Um, so really, that's how ResBaz is helping to build a training community. And I mean, that's just one example. I, I, I'm sure and I hope that there are many other ones happening throughout the whole three days um, that parallel that, um, that go, people are going away with at the end. Um, so really, that's why it's, it's important to me as a trainer, why ResBaz is important. Um, it builds that training community, and building a community is the only way, Aidan's talked about scalability, but to really scale, the community is the only way we can do it. We've got 30,000 researchers in Queensland, you've got 50,000 researchers in New South Wales and so on. Um, there's big numbers up on Aidan's graph, but that doesn't become close to the, the numbers up there. Um, I mean, yeah, many of you have run training workshops, and probably when you did it, they were massively oversubscribed. Um, I think it was back in eResearch Australasia in October, someone said there was something like one support professional for every 500 researchers, maybe more than that. Um, we can't do all the training they want. We can't help them with all the analysis they want. Um, but what we can do is we can bring them, them together, we can bring those researchers together, we can empower them to support each other and to learn from each other and to go away and solve their data analysis questions together. 
Um, and that's what ResBuzz does. It allows us to do this. It brings those connections and those relationships. Um, and so that's why QCIF is so enthusiastic about ResBuzz and why I see it being something that we're going to carry on being involved in for the foreseeable future. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. I'm a big fan of ResBuzz, as you know. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Fantastic. Any questions for Mark? Okay, having, having participated in ResBuzz Sydney, I guess... 100%, 100% and some. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry. I, there's one question. Sorry. I can yell. I can yell. Yep. Um, how does that scale across Queensland? Across the institutions across Queensland? Okay. So um, we've, we've tried to grow it out. Um, I mean, it, for the first three years ResBuzz was run, it was ResBuzz Brisbane. Um, and then a couple of sessions ones ago we we called it resbaz queensland we tried to have a satellite event um we streamed a lot more talks um but yeah the reality is that in queensland particularly we've got J jcu we've got central queensland university there's people scattered all over the state um and we haven't yet got an effective way of, of reaching out to those um we are trying to do it um one of the challenges we had is because they are so far away and they haven't got a culture of resbaz even when we do online activities, people aren't aware of it. So I think it's just a long-term one of offering things online, offering satellite events, and gradually building up awareness over time. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Liz is our final speaker for this morning. So thank you, Liz, another ResVaz champion. I could throw out my talk and start talking to you about ResBuzz <laughs> again, but I'm not going to do that because I've got to talk. <laughs> Sonia's going to tell me when, when, <laughs> when I'm going to find. Okay. So, hello. I work in the skills um, and workforce development team at the AI at DC. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about our Carpentries Partnership. So, we've heard about this organisation. Um, a few times today. The Carpentries are a global volunteer organisation uh, initiative who teach programming and data science skills to research communities. They, run, they provide openly licensed curriculum to do that uh, and a lot of their materials are about teaching researchers to um, work in open and reproducible ways. One of the um, the main reason that we're running a partnership is to make it easier for research organisations in Australia to access the instructor, train, instructor, training, instructor training program, uh, which is a train the trainer program that the Carpentries run. Um, it gives um, skills trainers enough pedagogical theory to handle a classroom. Hi, Philippa. <laughs> and, um, also, walk the talk when it comes to um, do, using inclusive practices to build a positive environment for learning so that researchers can, you know, you've got your handles on, your handles on the stuff and you can go away and you know what, you, you're confident enough to um, approach these software and these tools on your own and you know who you can come back to the next day when, you know, it balks and falls over and, and you need to, you want to check, check in again. So we, we ask, how can we, make our, um, how can we help our motivated champions, the people who want to do this training, more effective? So this partnership is one way of making it easier for organisations to access that trainer training. Um, my definition of easier is making something cheaper and making something simpler. So um, our partnership, which already has um, our key training organisations in Australia, such as QCIF, um, and uh, Mark's here from QCIF, and Intersect, Aidan. <laughs> I see more Intersect people <laughs> across the room, yeah. Okay, um, have been part of this partnership. And, um, and so we've got a handful of other key universities across Australia who have joined to, um, to run this train, train the Trainer program. So last year we trained about 100 um, people across like researchers, PhDs um, and su professional support staff. This year we're going to train about half of that because our, we're going to focus our attention 
um, more on enabling these newly um, these newly trained instructors to um, get them through their certification and also set them up so they can start teaching their first workshops. Last year there were about 28 carpentries, like badged carpentries workshops in Australia and the bulk of that really came from QCIF. And, and this is in addition to like, all of the workshops that um, Intersect run which are very much carpentries adjacent in, in some respects. So, um, so what I would really like to see in terms of success is seeing more of more evidence of carpentry's workshops being run by you know across our communities um, beyond beyond Queensland and beyond where Intersect run their workshops as well. For me, that means um, investing in the social infrastructure. And if you've heard me bang on about the carpentries before, what I usually say is they are great at that social infrastructure. They make it easy for people to go. Um, to connect to others and for you to actually find the people who are going to help. They, you jump on their Slack group, oh my goodness, you, would, you might jump, join in because someone told you to like, just ask them, see if you can find an answer, and within 24 hours you will have a handful of people saying, oh, did you know X, Y, Z, and here I'm here to help and I'm the regional coordinator. So it's a really welcoming community and I, I'm, I'm really behind them. This year, we are also going to kick off a series of bi-monthly Australia New Zealand community calls. So the carpentry set this infrastructure up so that people can come together. Um, someone has already set up the meeting room and organised a host and some speakers. You can join in and meet other people and find out what's going on in other corners of the, um, of the carpentry's verse, because I guess it is a bit of a multiverse in that way. I want to end um, with one final point about what I reckon success means in terms of this Carpentries partnership, and that is by bringing new organisations, in research organisations, into our partnership, we increase the number of um, active instructors in Australia, and the people who are being trained to do um, to do this uh, to run these instructor workshops, sorry, these Carpentries workshops, are actually paid to do it. So that we, um, so it's part of their um, whether they are employed on a casual basis through training organisations, or our institutions are able to supplement that with um, with other um, people being paid to do this work. Um, it's it's great. I mean, people join the carpentries because they're enthusiastic about what they've learnt and they really want to share it with others. And the instructor training enables them to be able to do that safely and effectively and in a, at a greater scale than one-on-one than -on -one, um, personal connection. So, obviously, competition for this partnership is going to be high. Um, but if you're enthused about this partnership and would like your, in your institution organisation to join, please come and talk to me. There's a little poster up there on the back that has a bit more information on the um, carpentries. And that's it from me. Yes. <laughs>